God is good, and all the time, God is good. Our first lesson from Psalm 19. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and the words to the end of the earth. The heavens, in the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent, and do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. From 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 8, and also verses 16 and 18. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. From now on there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me also, to all who have longed for his appearing. Continuing verse 16, At my first defense no one came to my support, but all deserted me. It may not be counted against them, but the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth, and the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our message is entitled, A Good Journey. This past summer, I was thrilled to see the eagles, the bald eagles, on the upper end of Lake Wilmore. And I actually got to watch while an adult eagle swooped down and, and just picked up a fish out of the, out of the lake. And then as I was watching it, it fed it to an immature eagle. Um, actually, the immature dropped it and it went down into the, the bush. But I suspect if you were to go and you were to look for those eagles where I saw them at the upper end of Lake Wilmore, I suspect they probably wouldn't be there. I think they've begun the great migration south for the winter. And I hope they have a good journey, and I'm really looking forward to seeing them again next spring. But that's the way of things, isn't it? Nothing lasts forever. And before we realize what's going on around us, the, the season's changed. I mean, where'd summer go? And now where are all the leaves going? Uh, now those eagles, they worked hard all, all spring and summer to establish their home, raise their young. But all of a sudden the season passed. And the young birds are flying south and mom and dad are going to join others of their kind. Now I suspect probably on this trip south, those young birds will come of age and they will find mates of their own. And while dear old mom and dad will probably return to the same nest at Lake Wilmore, um, I think the young birds will probably find a place of their own to begin their new families. Now as we watch the leaves fall and we see the frost on the meadows like it was this morning, it's rather apparent how quickly things can change around us. Just like the eagles 
our lives are changing as well. Have you noticed the grandmothers have changed? Um, for one thing, they seem to be a whole lot more young than they used to be. And, and while grandpas pretty much look the same as they've always looked, grandmas have somehow seemed to find a way to be the, beat the aging process. Uh, somebody gave me this poem on the internet. And it's entitled, Where Have All the Grandmas Gone? In the dim and distant past, when life's tempo wasn't so fast, grandma used to rock and knit, crochet, tat, and babysit. When the kids were in a jam, they could always call on Graham. But today she's in the gym, exercising to keep slim. She's checking the web or surfing the net, sending emails. Now she's really set. Nothing seems to stop or block her. Now the grandma's off her rocker. Maybe a lot of grandpas that are showing their age could learn something from grandma. Uh, maybe they could learn the secret to a good journey is getting off the rocker in the first place. Uh, like that old Nissan car commercial. Let's, or life's a journey, let's enjoy the ride. Because ready or not, the rest of our lives is on its way. Now it's been said, the only thing certain in this life is death and taxes. And from a pessimistic point of view, that's certainly true. But something else is true as well. Nothing but God ever remains the same. For us, that means every day is going to be a fresh start. It's going to be a new beginning in Christ Jesus. Or it means that we're getting older and one day closer to the day when we're going to stand before him. Now, as the Apostle Paul puts it in Romans 14, For we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Today, we want to focus on the one man in Scripture who handled aging, I think, well. And that would be Paul. We don't know how old Paul was when he died, um, when he was put to death by, we believe, Emperor Nero. Uh, in Philemon chapter 1, verse 9, Paul refers to himself as an old man as well as being a prisoner for Christ Jesus. Now, we may not think of him being old because he was still pretty active like when he was martyred. Uh, he was writing letters. He was traveling when he wasn't in jail. Um, he was put there for his preaching. Um, he was encouraging churches. Yet, of course, none of those things really require youth. But Paul's last letter probably was to his young protege, Timothy. Listen as Paul reflects on his life. Beginning verse 6, he, he writes, As for me, I am already being poured out as libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Now, think about Paul's words in light of his own life. And then think about your own life. What, how would others describe your life? Would they describe it as a good journey? Or maybe as a train wreck? Or something else? The thing that is really obvious in Paul's words, both here and, and throughout all of his letters, is Paul has no regrets. And that would be a wonderful way to end our lives, wouldn't it be? No regrets. The problem is our lives are full of challenges and tribulations and, and most likely our fair share of regret. But the amount of times that Paul had crashed and burned... I'm sure he could have sung the blues. Uh, he could have said, oh, woe is me. He, said, he could have been saying, man, I've been playing churches made up of ungrateful people. Uh, grumble, backbite, constantly backsliding into the unsavory lifestyles of their pagan years. Oh, woe is me. I've been shipwrecked, I've been beaten, I've been criticized, I've even been run out of town. I've spent an extraordinary amount of time in jail and... And for what? Paul did not dwell on that. Every time he survived a crash, 
He picked himself up. He dusted himself on, up, or off, and he went on with his service to Christ. Listen again to his words. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul said that he kept the faith. And when he said that, he, he meant that he had endured in spite of all kinds of stress and discomfort. We need to understand the life of faith can be hard. And Jesus put it like this. He said the gate is wide. The way is easy. The leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow. The way is hard. That leads to life. And those that find it are few. Life of faith can be hard. And there are people, because of conscience, that have quit good paying jobs. Because they couldn't reconcile the activities of the workplace with their Christian faith. There's people who have experienced social ostracism, some physical danger, because they re couldn't rec reconcile, you know, what was going on around them, the racial, the, the ethnic attitudes. Not with the teachings of Holy Scripture. There are many churches today that gloss over routinely the truth of God's Holy Word. And they would take away the cross and make it only an ornament, not something that's life-changing. But they're betraying what it really means to be the church of Jesus Christ in this day and in this age. Now, Paul knew that the life of faith can be hard. He had experienced it, but he had no regrets at the end of his life because he had given his life to Christ. He didn't regret the service that he had given to Christ. He didn't regret the time um, that he even was before he met Christ. We have to remember, Paul wasn't particularly a very nice person before his encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. Um, he was a religious zealot. And he's somewhat like all those religious zealots that have caused so much havoc in the world, you know, of late. Bombing abortion clinics. Bombing office towers of planes hitting the Twin Towers. Uh, thousands of innocent lives. By my definition, that kind of lifestyle is that of a religious terrorist. A zealot would probably just call Paul and others like him a terrorist. And I'm sure if Paul had been given the opportunity to go back and clear his name, he would. I think he would have given anything if that had never happened. But you know, you can't go back. Not really. The past is still the past. And it can't be changed. Yet Paul knew three things. First of all, maybe most importantly, he knew God had forgiven him. The slate had been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. And secondly, he knew he was a new person. The old Paul, or the old Saul, as he was known back in the old days, was dead. And thirdly, Paul knew that God had taken the broken pieces of his old life and had used them to make him a better person person fit for work in the kingdom. Now God can take our sinful past and he can make something beautiful out of it. Isn't that awesome? He can take all of your crash and burns and he can turn them into something that can really bring hope and meaning you know, to your life and to the lives of everybody all around you. Do we have any Star Trek Next Generation fans in here? Um, does anybody remember that one particular episode where the alien named Q, I mean, we're into aliens today. Um, it's all you find when you turn on the TV. But in, in Star Trek Next Generations, Captain Picard is transported by the alien Q back to his youth, and he's given a, a do-over, a chance to relive his life. And now older and wiser, Captain Picard, this time he acts less reckless, more responsibly the way he always wished he would have done things the first time around. But what happens next is interesting. When Q takes him back to the present under this new scenario, instead of being the captain of the Enterprise, Picard is now just a lowly technician in engineering. 
And it turns out all those experiences of his youth, as reckless as they had been, they were a part of who he was now as an adult. He was captain because he had learned some hard lessons. Lessons he could not learn any other way than the hard way. God can take the broken pieces of any one of our lives. And he can use them to build something really beautiful. We often say, God doesn't cause suffering. But God can use suffering to make us into better people. God certainly doesn't cause us to sin. But God can even take our sins and use them for his glory. Every one of us starts out like young eagles in a nest. Uh, who we will be, what kind of journey we're going to have in this life, whether good or bad, it's largely up to us. How far we're going to fly from the nest, how, how much we take responsibility for our lives, that's up to us. But to have the best journey of all, we need to invite someone else to come on board. And that person, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Paul so, so quickly discovered, our Lord is not afraid of a bumpy ride. Life's a journey. And so do your best with Christ's help to make a good one. And really enjoy the ride. Amen? Let us pray. Father God, we'd all like to end our lives without any regrets. Knowing, Lord, we gave it our best shot and we just let go and let you do the rest. Father, we know that there have been times when we haven't made those who went before us proud. But Lord, we like to think that you could take even our biggest goof-ups, our messes, and turn them into something that brings much fruit and much joy to you and to your kingdom. And so we thank and we praise you for inviting us to be a part of the very family of our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.